Hey everybody, welcome to Song and Sword. It's so good to be with you again. Pastor Mike here inviting you in every week at 10 o'clock at Song and Sword so we can um, share the Word of God. 10 o'clock on Sundays that is, by the way. So grab your Bibles, grab something to take communion with us later. The body and blood of Christ will share that at the end of the sermon. I'm so glad you're here. And if you're new to Song and Sword, maybe you don't know this, but if you've been around for this last week, you know what's going on. I'm so excited to keep telling you that on August 20th at the Bloomington Arena in downtown, Grossinger Arena, we're going to have a Song and Sword Vision Sunday. And it's going to be everything that God's calling us to for the future of Song and Sword. You can invite anybody. You don't have to register. Invite your friends, your family, your cousins, your nieces, nephews, uh, co-workers, neighbors, anybody you want. Bring them on that day at 9 o'clock, and we're going to share the vision of Song and Sword. Part of that vision that I have to kind of let the cat out of the bag here right now, is that September 10th, Lord willing, we're going to start meeting every Sunday, gathering together as a church. And in order for us to do that well, we want to have great children's programming. So if you would, would you go to kidsatsongandsword.com, kidsatsongandsword.com, to tell us if you plan on bringing uh, your child or your grandchild or a friend's child one year old to third grade. If they fall in that age range, we want to know who they are, their name, contact, all that stuff. Just go to Kids at Song and Sword. You can uh, figure that out on your own. Everything else for Song and Sword, go to songandsword.com, and uh, we share prayer requests with you, all updates, all news, all that stuff. So glad you guys are with us. God bless you guys, and thanks for all your support and contributions. Well, today we're going to get into the Word of God, Acts chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, open them up. And we're going to start by talking about um, short-term mission trips. If you have been in church uh, for a long time, it's very likely that you've been on a short-term mission trip. A short-term mission trip is a trip of about seven to ten days where a bunch of Christians go somewhere other than their home, and they serve people in the name of Jesus to share the gospel of Christ. So maybe you went with your youth group growing up, maybe with your church. Uh, people have gone to the Appalachian Mountains to help the poor people there repair their roofs. Uh, people have built houses for families in Mexico, in uh, Dominican Republic, the homeless shelter work in inner cities, uh, vacation Bible schools in Grenada, baseball clinics in the Dominican Republic, clean water systems in El Salvador. All of these and more are short-term mission trips. And a short-term mission trip is life-changing. And, and I, I've told a lot of people this. I'm like, if you go on a missions trip, it will change your whole life. Three things it always does for me. And I've been like, I don't know, 35 or 40 times in my lifetime. First of all, I see the bigness of God and the people that he created. This world is bigger than we ever imagined. Number two, I'm reminded that everyone needs the good news of Jesus Christ. And I've got it. And number three, I'm reminded of how blessed I am to live in this country, have the resources I do, and my responsibility with that to the rest of the world. That's why one of my biggest goals in 2024 for the Song and Sword ministry is to lead a missions trip, Lord willing, prayerfully, to the Dominican Republic. Stay tuned, go to songandsword.com and you'll get all that information. But um, the church that the world needs now is this sending church. Literally, this whole global world needs people that are following Jesus Christ to be sent out to tell the good news of Jesus Christ and to share their lives with them. And so this idea of sending, guess where it began? In the Bible. Acts chapter 13, we're going back to this place called Antioch, this teaching church we talked about last week. And today we get to eavesdrop on their first short-term mission trip that came out of this church and how they, were be, they became a sending church and we can learn from that. So here we go. This is the word of the Lord. Most important thing you're going to hear today. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and they sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Would you join me and ask God to speak to us about being this church that the world needs now? God, would you come now by the power that only you can do uh, through the, the technical work of videography and editing and transmitting this uh, all through the world? I pray that you would touch every soul right now, every person that's listening to this. Would you inspire us to be like this church in Antioch, to be willing to go, to be willing to send in the name of Jesus Christ. God, would you come now, fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can preach. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. 
Well, these days, if you want to go on a missions trip, uh, you usually have to sign up on some website or something. There's a sign up for it. And then uh, you have to go to a meeting. Maybe you have to fill out a, you know, some kind of a questionnaire to see if you're qualified. You have to deposit some money. Uh, you have to update your you know, medical shots and you've you got to get a passport. You've got to do medical liability forms and all that kind of stuff. You've got to prepare a testimony. There's all kinds of meetings to go to. It's really, really a long-term process to go on a short-term mission trip. But you eventually get there and you go. But today, the short-term mission trip we find in Acts chapter 13 is a little bit different. The result's the same, but it really comes out of this church that was a teaching church and it births this short-term mission trip. Let's just get to the Word of God today, and here's the first point that I would start with. Ascending church is first a teaching, worshiping, and fasting church. So take that in. Ascending church is first a teaching, worshiping, and fasting church. If you teach and preach the Word of God and the good news that Jesus is the Christ, people are going to be inspired eventually to share that good news, and they're going to want to go and share it with other people to focus outward and become ascending church. And, and, and we find here in this church of teachers that there are five guys, not five guys pizza, but five guys who are the teaching team of this church in Antioch. And, um, and it says that they're prophets and teachers. There were in the church of Antioch prophets and teachers. So these five guys had these two gifts. We don't know if three of them had one gift and two the other, or they all had the same gifts. We don't know what the breakdown was. There were prophets. Prophetes is the Greek word pro, before, Fetes is to say or to predict. So a prophet says something that's going to happen from the Lord. In the Old Testament, if you want the gift of prophecy, you should know that usually a prophet gives bad news in the Old Testament. (laughs) A prophet usually says, you're going to be destroyed because God's tired of you sinning. Uh, And often it, it comes with a warning. So just if you have your Bibles open like I do to Acts 13, right across the page, Acts 11, there's a prophet who's already predicted that there's going to be a famine. And so they took up an offering so that they could help the church in Jerusalem there. So that's the work of the prophet. Teachers, remember, are those who teach the good news of Jesus Christ and teach all of his belief, uh, what he taught when he was here and all the apostles' teaching. And remember at the end of Acts 11 last week, we said that Paul and Barnabas, I keep calling him Paul, he's Saul right now, his, cha- his name was changed to Paul. But Saul and Barnabas, they teach in this church for a whole year. Somewhere along the way, they added these prophets and teachers, these five guys who were the ones who were the teaching part of this church. Barnabas, we've already seen him a lot in the book of Acts, and so we have him. Simeon called Niger. What do we know about him? Well, we know that the Niger is the Latin for the word black. And so we, we understand this is probably a description of his skin color. He's from Africa somewhere. What part of Africa? We don't know, but this is interesting. Some theologians hear Simeon called Niger and Simon from Cyrene, which is also in northern Egypt. And guess what? Simon of Cyrene was the guy who carried Jesus' cross in Luke uh, 23. So is he the same guy? Because Simeon and Simon are really the same name in the first century. We don't know. It would be cool if one of the teachers in Antioch was the guy that actually helped carry the cross of Jesus Christ. We also have this guy named Lucius of Cyrene. Lucius Cyrene definitely is in North Africa. It's right next to Egypt and what would be modern-day Libya and, and those parts in there. But in Romans 16.21, we have this Lucius that's with Paul on some mission trip. And uh, Paul says, hey, Lucius says hi to you. Again, Lucius is a very, very popular name in the first century. It'd be like saying, hey, Mike from Illinois sends you greetings. It's hard to decide who it was. And so who was this guy? We don't know. Now, this is a ne- the next guy is really interesting. Manaean. Manaean, it says, who was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. That word to be brought up with literally means nourished together. In fact, the root word means to nurse. So it's very possible. Let me tell you how this happens. Manaean, how would he become uh, acquainted with Herod's family? Well, Herod the Great is the one who built the main road, the major highway in Antioch. It was one of his big projects, colonnades, shops, marble, all this stuff. It's possible that Herod the Great's son met the son of uh, met Menaean, and they became friends. This probably means that Menaean was trained and brought up in Rome under Roman understanding. So he's a really, really educated, smart, worldly guy. And then you have Saul, 
who of course is the apostle. He would write most of the uh, New Testament eventually. But Saul, remember, he was an old Jewish guy that knew, he was a Pharisee. He knew the Jewish law. So we have this naturally diverse kind of team here. We have a guy from Africa. We have a guy that might have carried the cross of Jesus. We have a guy that is affiliated with Rome and all of its practices. We have a Jewish stalwart, and we have Barnabas, right? So this is an incredible team. And in the middle of this this teaching team, they're doing something that we do today. They are worshiping and fasting. They were worshiping in the Lord and fasting, it says in verse uh, verse 2. And we're told that this church is worshiping and fasting um, as a natural part of their worship. By the way, that word worship there is a word that you might understand or recognize if you grew up in a more formal church. If you've ever heard of the word liturgy, a liturgy is a set uh, number of things you say in a worship service. We sing this song, we say this word, we give this blessing, and it's a liturgy. The word liturgos is the word that we have here for worship. And we get the word liturgy from. What does it mean? They were in a church service. They were singing. They were praying. They were taking prayer requests. They were teaching. They were also fasting. Fasting in the Bible, again, usually represents repentance or seeking God. And uh, we don't know what they were seeking. Maybe they were seeking direction for what he wanted them to do next. Now, here's a question for you. Many of you asked this question. Do Christians have to fast? And my normal response is, no, you don't have to. The Bible doesn't command that you fast, but we see most people who follow Christ fasting. In fact, Jesus Christ himself fasted. So if our Lord and Savior fasted, it would make sense that you and I would consider that as something to do. In the the Bible times, they fasted from food and drink to get close to God, to, to repent to God, to get direction from God. I believe a good fast for us these days is to get rid of the iPhone, the internet, and all the stuff that distracts us Um, in the digital world to unplug literally so that we can hear God and seek God in a totally different way. That's the kind of fasting that I encourage today. But here's what I know. A steady diet of inspired Bible preaching and teaching will lead to seeking the Spirit's direction through worshiping and fasting. And here's the good news. When we worship and we fast and we teach the Word of God, the Spirit is intensely interested in showing us where to go. And that's the second thing I want to share with you out of this passage today. The sending agent of a sending church is the Holy Spirit. You can think of it in your own mind if you want to. You can come up with whatever idea, place you want to go. You can think you want to do a work for God. But the sending agent of a sending church is always the Holy Spirit. This is important for us to consider uh, when we talk about being a sending church because it's kind of popular these days in churches to go, the church, a younger generation, the church should always be sending. We should never do anything inward. We should never take care of each other. It should always just be outwardly focused. But the problem is that's not biblical. Um, For instance, look at this passage right here. Two out of five got sent. What was up with Simeon and Lucius Lucius and Menaean? They must have felt like, oh, I guess we're not good enough to go on the mission trip. No, here's the thing. The Holy Spirit says, I want Saul and Barnabas to go. I want you three to stay put and do what I've called you to do here. You see, if the church sent people all the time, everyone all the time, anyone who wanted to go, then we'd have an underdeveloped and injured Christians sending them out and creating a lot of man-made missions. What we want when we go on short-term or long-term missions is the Holy Spirit directing us and sending the right people to the right work. That's why we have this. The Holy Spirit says... The Holy Spirit speaks here and says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. Um, Here's how the Holy Spirit communicates to them. He says something. What does that mean? Does he speak audibly? Uh, I'll get to that in just a moment. We don't really know. but, But later on, we find that when Paul is on his second missionary journey in Acts 16, the Holy Spirit also tells him where to go and not to go. Acts 16 says, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So on these mission trips, the Holy Spirit's going, don't go there, don't go there, give me Saul and Barnabas. The Holy Spirit is speaking into this mission trip. Now here's the question, how did the Holy Spirit speak to them? Well, the obvious answer is there were prophets on this teaching team. It would have been really easy for the Holy Spirit to go, hey, you're a prophet, say this is what this is going to happen. Maybe that's what happened. It could be that it was an audible sign that the Holy Spirit just spoke. And they said, oh, Saul and Barnabas, you guys are the ones. 
Remember, the Spirit can do anything that He wants to do. He, he literally could have just moved within everybody in the church so that when they said amen to the prayer, they all looked at Saul and Barnabas and said, it's pretty obviously the Holy Spirit's calling you. We don't know how it happened. But here's the question I think is important for us. Can the Holy Spirit speak to us today? And if so, how can He do it? Now, over the years, I've learned that the Spirit um, is interested in communicating to us. And I believe this with all my heart, that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you, He wants to communicate with you, He wants to guide you and direct you in steps and works that He has for you. And so we should think about how do we hear the Holy Spirit today? And I, I want to give you a few ways here in just a minute, but I want to give you this caution to begin with. The Spirit of God will always line up with Jesus and the written Word of God. In other words, if you say, the Holy Spirit's telling me to do this, and it doesn't support the teaching and preaching of Jesus Christ, the living Word, it's not the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit's telling you to do something or say something or giving you some words, and it's not lining up with the Word of God, the Bible, it's not the Holy Spirit. So with that said, let me tell you some ways that I've experienced the Holy Spirit speaking. There are six ways here. This is not exhaustive, just what I've experienced. Maybe it will help you. Number one, the Holy Spirit sometimes speaks miraculously. Remember, the Holy Spirit can do whatever He wants. I've talked to brothers and sisters in Christ in Morocco who have received visions. They were laying in bed, and Jesus appeared to them by the power of the Holy Spirit and said, I want you to turn to Jesus as Lord and Savior. And they left they left their Muslim faith and became Christians because of this miraculously intervention of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does that sometimes. Sometimes the Holy Spirit speaks through other Christians. Uh, a brother or sister in Christ may come up to, to you and say something like, hey, I, I have a word from the Lord for you. Now, I have to tell you, I, my skeptical antenna go up when somebody comes and says, hey, I've got a word from God for you. But you know what? I've learned to listen because they often say something I've been praying about. They say something that's encouraging to my ministry or directional. They wouldn't know of it any other way except that the Holy Spirit directed them. So sometimes I hear from other Christians. Sometimes he speaks in community. The church or a small group or a group of people who love the Lord. This word and prayer and fasting community that we find in Antioch. And um, he speaks there. A consensus of spirit-filled people. I often say this uh, to people. If you're in a group of 10 or 12 people and two think this and two think that and four think that and three think this, guess what? It may not be the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit usually is unified and speaks all together as one. Sometimes you can just look around at each other and go, is this what the Holy Spirit's saying? And you go, we think it is. And the consensus of the group speaks. Sometimes he speaks by bringing unexplainable peace. Sometimes you pray about something for weeks or months or years and you go, I don't know what to do. I don't know which direction. Should I do this or that? And all of a sudden you wake up one day and you go, huh, I think we should do this. That's the Holy Spirit. He's a Holy Spirit of peace. Sometimes he speaks within us clearly. You just, we just sense where you're reading the scripture or you're praying or you're walking on the trail or you're taking a bike ride or you're hanging out with your kids or you're at a movie. It could be any number of things. And all of a sudden you just get this clear message from the Holy Spirit. Don't think that that's weird. Don't think that that's outer, you know, just out of reality. The Holy Spirit can speak in that way. Um, he also speaks as we faithfully follow Jesus day by day. Here's what I've noticed about the Holy Spirit. I often recognize Him most in my rearview mirror. If I'm faithful to God, if I follow what I know to be true about Jesus and the Scripture in my life, and I yield to the Holy Spirit, I can look back 10 years from now and go, I know what the Holy Spirit was doing there. He did something miraculous, and He was guiding me. I don't fully understand what's happened to me and my family the last four and a half months, but here's what I know. I'm going to look back five years from now and go, that was directional from the Holy Spirit. And that's the way it's going to be because the Holy Spirit wants to speak to me. So the Spirit speaks, but the, the Spirit always speaks to a work that He's called us to. Okay, I want you to see this. He says, set aside, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. The Holy Spirit is at work in the world today proclaiming Jesus Christ in a million different ways, billions of different ways. And he says, I've got to work for these guys to do. Now, so is the, is the Holy Spirit calling just Saul and Barnabas or these other three and the rest of the church? The answer is yes. On one hand, we're all set apart to the work of evangelizing. The Spirit's called us all to do some work. Acts 1.8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. We're all called to be witnesses, both great and small. Uh, in, in Ephesians 2.10, one of my favorite passages in the Bible 
It says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Did you know that the Holy Spirit has good work for you today on your sports team, in the gym, at the store, in the checkout line, in your neighborhood, in your cul-de-sac, in your home, in your dorm? God doesn't waste any opportunity, and the Holy Spirit is always calling us and setting us apart to share the good news wherever we are. On the other hand, some people like Barnabas and Saul in this story are set aside by the Spirit for a specific work. Some people in the church are called to sell all their stuff and move to a foreign country and learn a language. Some people are called to use their business to to make it bigger for the name of Jesus Christ, to, to start some kind of food pantry that explodes or some kind of service that changes the world. Listen, I, here's what, I can't explain fully how the Holy Spirit calls you to something specific, but I know that He does call people to specific works. In fact, Acts 9.15, when Saul was being converted, he, it was told to him that you will be a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles and kings and children of Israel, and you, I will show you how much you must suffer for my name. Paul was called to the Gentiles. He couldn't get away from that. It was his calling for life. I know this one thing about me. I'm called to preach. That's who I am. I've known that since I'm six years old. I can't tell you how. I just know that the Holy Spirit says, this is the work I have for Mike Baker, right? And so as we wait for this, um, we have to do what we know. What is the work that the Spirit has called you to do and set you apart for right now? I know most of us want to move somewhere else. We want to be something else, doing something else. We want to achieve something in life, especially if you're younger. But the truth is the Holy Spirit has you where you are right now doing what you're doing. It might just be being a stay-at-home mom, raising three godly kids. And it may be being a missionary to the world. And everything in between those two things are valid callings by the Holy Spirit. The question is, are you listening to the Holy Spirit's call if you will start with your current place and work and say, I want to serve you, God, the Spirit, if He wants you to go somewhere, will let you know, just as He did Paul and Barnabas. So I've said all that to get us to the trip. And this is the final point I want to make. Ascending church sins strategically with prayer and fasting and blessing. I say strategically because these guys took off on a trip. And maybe you've been a little bit distracted today because of my awesome drawing here with this map of the Middle Eastern world, and I hope this makes sense to you. I wanted to show you this actual trip, what most scholars would refer to as Paul's first missionary journey, okay? So I want to show you, again, Jerusalem's down here. 300 miles to the north is Antioch. That's where we're at. Modern-day Turkey, past Syria, right? So here's the way that they take this trip. They go from Antioch, and they go down to the port city of Seleucia. And from Seleucia, they take a boat over to Cyprus. Now, I say in, the, I say in this um, outline, I say the ascending church sins strategically. Why do you think their first place was Cyprus? Because this is where Barnabas was from. Barnabas probably said, hey, if the, if the Holy Spirit's calling us, and maybe he did or did not give him exact directions, let's go down to Cyprus. It's my home, my home island. I know it. They started here in Salamis, the city. It went through all the way over here to Paphos. God was doing some cool stuff. They sailed up here to a place called Perga, and then they made their way up to Pisidian Antioch. Look at that word, Antioch, that's in Pisidia, not the Antioch over here in Syria. They went over to Iconium. They went down to uh, Lystra, where they got stoned, not that kind of stone, the kind of stone where they throw rocks at you. And then they went to Derby, and then they went back to Lystra, back to Iconium, back to Antioch, back to Italia, and then they sailed straight back home to Antioch. Now, here's the amazing thing. I hope this, this helps you put this in your mind. That's 1,400 miles of travel. That's a period of maybe six to 10 months. We're really not sure how long it took. It's really a longer short-term mission trip. But these guys were gone for over half a year for sure, 1,400 miles. They had been stoned. They had baptized a lot of people. They met some people along the way. Uh, six, uh, uh, nine different cities, and all of this is described in Acts 13 and 14. So I hope you'll look at that and check it out. But what, the point that I want to make here is that they had a plan, and they just kept saying, okay, what are we going to do next? It's not wrong to have a plan, even if the Holy Spirit leads you. And that brings me back to this. Just because the Holy Spirit called Paul and Barnabas, 
called them to a work. He doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that the sending church is done. What happened after the calling? Look in verse 3. They, the, the Holy Spirit says in verse 2, set apart Barnabas and Saul. This is the work I've called them to. In verse 3, then after fasting and praying and laying on of hands, the church has still got stuff to do. They just didn't say, well, Paul and Barnabas, it's all you now. Get out of here. We'll see you later. No, they, they pray and they fast and they lay hands on them. The laying on of hands, by the way, what were they praying and fasting for? They're probably praying and fasting, God, now that you've sent them, would you open up doors? Would you spread the good news of Jesus Christ? Would you give them safety? All the stuff we pray for when we send people on a short-term trip. They're praying and they're fasting even harder. The church is, and it ain't, is not done. It's a sending church. And so now they've got work to do. Now they have to support these guys who are leaving in fact, the Bible tells us that they lay hands on them. This laying on of hands is a blessing, probably by these three other teachers, but probably by the whole church to lay hands on these guys and go, we bless you, we set you apart, we release you. That's that, what that word, um, they sent them off. They, they released them to this mission. God bless you guys and go with them. And the whole time they were gone, they were praying and fasting for this mission trip to happen. The sending church still cares about the people they send but here's the thing I want to encourage you with today. Some point, when you're called by the Holy Spirit, you've got to take a first step. Strategically, it made sense that they would sail to Cyprus because that's where Barnabas was from, but they still had to take that step. They had to walk 10 miles south from Antioch to the port. They had to get a ship that was going to Cyprus, and they took this step called faith. Guys, some of us are stuck in this place where the Holy Spirit's called us, we sense the Holy Spirit's movement, we think there's a work that He's called us to, but we're stuck. We're not going to take that small step of faith. The only way that you get over, all the way to Derby and back is to get to Seleucia. You have to take the first step of faith. I hope that all of us have a chance to take a step of faith and go on a missions trip, short-term trip. I honestly hope and pray that someday God will raise up some people from Song and Sword Ministry that will go and be full-time missionaries throughout the world. And I hope and pray that Song and Sword will go into all the world via the internet and via all the people that we train in the coming years with good news and, and the sending and the sharing of people's lives that we send over there, that we're a sending church. But mostly, I pray that this week that you'll listen to the Holy Spirit and ask Him, where is it you're sending me and what are you calling me to and setting me apart for? And that you'll spend some time taking some small, intentional steps in that direction. That's how ascending church goes, where everybody in the church feels sent. And they're able to send others by prayer and fasting and support. May God send you this week and may you go. God bless you guys. See you next Sunday. Once again, we get a chance to share the body and blood of Jesus together. And I want to circle back the end of this trip. And I, I can't imagine what this homecoming was like. But in Acts chapter 14, at the end of this trip that we just preached about, it says in verse 27, when they arrived, they gathered the church together and they declared all that God had done with them and how he opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples there. Can you imagine this homecoming? They sent Paul and Barnabas off and Paul and Barnabas come back and they go, hey, we want to share all that God's done. And they were able to share a meal together again. And Paul and Barnabas, I'm sure, had shared communion every Sunday or whenever they could, but it was so good to be back with their family. And that's what we are at Song and Sword, a family. And so we take this every Sunday, the body of Jesus Christ reminding us his body was broken for us. Let's take it together. In the same way, family remembers the sacrifices made, Jesus' blood, that washes our sins away. Let's celebrate that together. And God, may this, um, this time of celebrating the body and blood of Christ remind us that it's not to be kept among ourselves, although it's sweet to share this together. May we go and may you send us in Jesus' name. Amen.